So I'm just going to do a brief intro of our panellists and then we're going to get uh, dug in to some of the issues and solutions and challenges, etc. So we have got Adrian Ling, who is the Managing Director of Plamel, which is the UK's oldest vegan company. Um, Adrian's, I had the pleasure of meeting Adrian's father, Arthur, who went vegan in 1927. Uh, it still blows my mind when I say that and try to imagine someone being vegan back then. Um, and Plamel um, produces dairy, a range of dairy-free goods, particularly chocolate. Um, in fact, Adrian is the vegan Willy Wonka. He has his own chocolate factory, a vegan chocolate factory, where he makes their Plamel's own brand as, and also makes... Um, uh, chocolate and other products for other vegan brands as well. So welcome, Adrian. Delighted Pleasure to, have, to be with you today. Have you here. Lovely. We've also got Tammy Fry. Tammy is the uh, marketing director and part of the family, the Fry Family Food Company, which is an international plant-based meat brand. Um, and uh, I think recently joined the Live Kindly group, uh, which is an umbrella group of other plant-based meat companies. And we'll find out a little bit more about that when we talk to Tammy, but great to have you here, Tammy. Welcome. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks for having me. We've also got Rimi and Manav Thapur, um, and they are from Love Raw, which is a vegan confectionery and snack company. Now, some of you might recognize Rimi because she appeared on Dragon's Den, which is the UK, for our international uh, visitors, the, uh, that's the UK equivalent of Shark Tank. And Rimi famously turned down two offers on Dragon's Den um, because she wanted to, to wait for the right investor, and I believe that's now happened. And despite by turning down that deal, the company has gone from strength to strength. So uh, welcome, Rimi and Manav. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Pleasure. We've also got Joe Hill, who is one of the co-founders of One Planet Pizza. I think we were due to have Mike as well, uh, but he was uh, had to uh, do something. But we're delighted to have Joe here representing. And One Planet Pizza, a very exciting brand, a very fast growing frozen vegan pizza brand. And I believe the first of its kind in the UK. So great to have you guys here. And I'm, I'm looking at your thing behind your poster behind you and you're making me hungry. Joe, even though I've had my my dinner, <laughs> great to have you here. Pizza later as well. <laughs> And now, of course, the vegan and plant-based sector is not only made up of just food. Um, and so I'm really happy that we've got Laura Way, who's here representing vegan fashion. Laura is the founder of Watch, which is a wonderful vegan watch company that makes uh, unisex styles for both men and women. So lovely to have you here, Laura. Thanks, Katrina. Lovely to be here. And finally, uh, we have Sue Harrison, who's the head of sales at Mahi Naturals. We were due to have Meghna Patel, who is one of the, the founders, but uh, unfortunately she had a, a, an issue come up at the last minute. But we're delighted to have Sue, who's the head of sales. And Mahi Naturals provides skincare, uh, hair care and organic beauty products, which are sourced from across the globe. So welcome, Sue. Thank you for joining us at the last minute. Thank you. Welcome. Great. So as Tim mentioned, 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, has not turned out the way that any of us expected. I mean, none of us could predict uh, what, what could happen. And it's really thrown society, uh, businesses, uh, people, etc., into a bit of a tailspin. <coughs> so I'd love to talk to each of you to, to find out what impact has lockdown and the COVID-19 situation, what impact has that had on you as a manufacturer and supplier? And what have you had to do to survive? So I'm going to kick off with Adrian, because I know you've got a factory, you've got staff, you employ a lot of people. Tell us how this, the situation impacted you and what have you had to do to keep into business? Well, I think one of the first things uh, to remember is that um, when we entered the uh, COVID situation, um, we didn't act exactly go into it in a position of closed eyes because um, if we're dealing with international uh, companies and events, um, it was quite obvious what was going to happen into lockdown. And so um, for us, we had our first crisis meeting um, on the 9th of March, you know, two weeks even before the, the date of lockdown. So we could see the writing on the wall, we could see what was going on. Uh, and I think it, it, it's important to keep up with these international events because that does give you a head start. It does lead you. We had two weeks 
of actually uh, preparation to which we got well ahead with to start with. And so as a manufacturing business um, and being part of trade bodies, uh, what became very, very clear very early on is that uh, food manufacturing was uh, going to be classed as essential workers. Um, I think it was later described as key workers, but at the time it was called essential workers and therefore um, manufacturing business could, if it was safe to do so, continue. And so that was the number one um, type of key bits of information that came along um, about where we were to go. So following that, um, we really had to decide um, where we were going to go, what we were going to do, because also uh, I have to say the kind of the whole thing almost reminded me of the 9-11 type issue. But we have to take this as a long term um, decision. This, whilst it's come along, why you say apparently sort of suddenly, well, you have to be prepared for all events. And so you have to take the long term. What are we going to do? What are we going to try and achieve? Do we lock down? Do we keep going? You know, do we shut down? Do we reopen? How do we continue? And it becomes apparent that, of course, our customers um, who are supplying into the food chain um, are carrying on. And therefore, to um, continue as a company, continue employment, um, what actually has to happen is the company has to continue producing to supply the people that we supply so they are actually able to do so. And so all those sort of decisions have to be made in the long term, because if we don't continue to supply, what will happen is that actually if we stop, when we come back, if there's this sort of, and at the time there was this magical, well, it's all going to happen and it's going to come back and, you know, we can uh, get back to normal. Um, I think it became very apparent very, very quickly, even in that two weeks, that um, new normal wasn't going to happen perhaps ever. And so to maintain jobs and to maintain production, it actually had to keep going. Uh, and, and that's the important thing, really, that, that we learned very, very early on is, is assessing that, uh, that, that the, we're part of the food chain. And that even though um, we're very proud to have uh, vegan food, vegan food, uh, people who consume vegan foods have the equal right to their food chain supply as any other supplier. And so um, whilst there were some who were saying, oh, why, why is a vegan company staying open and all those sorts of things? Well, we're part of the food chain and um, we should be supplying that. So it's a long term issue and we don't see that necessarily that we are even at the, in famous words, we're, we're, we're probably only at the end of the beginning. Yeah. And um, there's a long way to go. And as I say, uh, if you looked at 9-11, everybody thought, okay, that's, that's it. The impact is going to last for many, many years. And decisions have to be made very early on into um, the long-term future and the best way to carry on and to keep the jobs. So did you have to do anything specific, Adrian? Did you kind of, was it almost like business as usual for you? What, what, what did you have to do differently, if anything? Well, in, in food manufacturing, of course, um, you're quite used to systems and you're quite used to hygiene type um, ways of going about work. And so um, it was a very steep learning curve, obviously, to incorporate the, the COVID, the social distancing and all those sort of measures in place. Um, and, and, and lots of other bits and pieces such as um, a lot of the cleaning materials used um, have to be resistant and, and have to deal with the, the COVID um, rather than just any, any general bacteria, for instance. So there's a lot of technical issues going on. We had a lot of people working on it for a lot of, lot of those two weeks and, and after that because, <clears throat> excuse me, looking back, we're all on this big steep learning curve and um, even uh, terminologies we use now were not being used at the time back in, you know, in late March. So we were doing a lot of, of work internally to ensure that not only could we, uh, we could manufacture today and tomorrow, but we were starting to put things into place um, that would last for a long time. Um, it was already clear to us 
for instance, this was going to last way into the end of this year and not go away. So we needed to have a sustainable model rather than one that was just a temporary fix. And that, and that is important. And, you know, we see some countries, the way they're dealing with it, have, have come into a lot of criticism. But it's, um, you know, a sustainable rod model rather than a knee-jerk model. Nice. I like that. Thank you. So, Adrian, obviously your business has been in, around for a long time. So I'd like to go to Joe because uh, One Planet Pizza is a fairly new brand, um, a pizza brand. Tell us um, what's the situation been like for you in terms of the, the whole pandemic situation? Yeah, uh, similar points to Adrian, really, that um, we, we already had a lot of the systems in place being uh, with South Shore accredited. Uh, in the food industry, which allows us to sell to certain customers with, with their own standards. So we had those, um, you know, hygiene and, and cleaning systems in place already, which were very, um, you know, well suited and, and helped us reduce the risks of infection and keep the staff safe. Um, as an FMCG, we, we were in a very lucky position so that when we went into lockdown, most consumers straight away would rush to the supermarkets and panic buy and panic shop and, and stock up on frozen uh, as much as anything. Um, I, I guess Tammy maybe will echo this as well, that we actually found a real, a real increase in sales, um, which was incredibly lucky considering uh, everything else seemed to fall down around us in lockdown. Um, we actually had a real spike in sales. Um, I think that's partly as an F FMCG, it's also frozen. It's a very fortunate position to be in. And pizza is quite a safe, reliable uh, meal that people can stock up on, fill up their freezers, and, and it's there ready for them uh, when they run out of their chilled or fresh produce. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was a very interesting time for us. And again, as Adrian said, um, the sort of fear around the start of the pandemic was, are we going to be classed as key workers? Um, or are we going to have to shut down our factory, which could... That, as, a, as a young small business, that could be the end of us. It would be really hard to recover from a factory close. We've only got um, a relatively small team compared to some of the guys here. There's about um, eight full-time kitchen staff. And uh, we're much more of a family. My mum's the kitchen manager. Um, her best friend, Tana, uh, has been with us since we launched in 2016. Um, and then her daughter works for us. So we're very tight-knit team and, and me and Michael with them every day so for, for us it, the biggest fear was um, you know having to make staff redundant um, uh, or you're all closing the factory altogether so we've, we've been really really lucky and, and incredibly grateful that we're in a good position with frozen pizza that um, sales increased and we were able to actually um, give the staff more hours and um, uh. whilst trying to keep them safe with all the systems in place. Fantastic. I love that. Yeah, we've seen various reports actually it's been quite heartening to see particularly those you know, sales of vegan products, plant based meat products are, have been going up, which is great. Um, so let's go to Tammy. Um, interesting, because I, I think what was interesting, I noticed with with Tammy, with everybody else, um, you've all got e commerce models, but so people can buy your products directly. Whereas with fries, you you haven't got that you people can only get them from retailers and uh, and supermarkets. So I don't know if that's had any kind of impact. But talk to us, do, does what Adrian and uh, uh, Joe have said, does that resonate or what's been the situation with fries? Yeah, I mean, to echo what Adrian said, you know, um, we obviously produce in South Africa and we do have uh, 400 staff. Um, and we had probably one of the strictest lockdowns worldwide in South Africa. We had level five lockdown in March, um, which ran for about, I would say, five weeks. Um, we now at uh, level three. Um, which has still a lot of limitations. <laughs> it is, it's a very difficult um, in South Africa at the moment. Tell me, but, when you say level five, so what was happening in level five? Did you have to shut the factory down? Did you have to lay off staff? What, 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 did, that, what did that look like for you? Yeah, well, um, to echo Adrian's words, you know, we were an essential service by the South African government. So even in level five lockdown, we were bringing staff to the factory and, um, you know, these staff, don't have a means to to get to the to the factory that easily, so it was organising um, public transport, uh, maintaining social distancing with public transport. So there was a whole, there were some challenges, but um, every staff member had to be issued with a, a certificate, 
uh, that would allow them to, to come to and from work because there were police on the road and monitoring right. that. Um, so there were, you know, there were challenges, but because we were an essential service, um, we were allowed to continue operation, which was great because when so many people weren't working, our staff were really, you know, uh, fortunate and happy to be able to continue working, um, especially in an economy like South Africa, where you have such high unemployment rates already. So one staff member might be a breadwinner for 11 or 12 people. So it's critical that they continue working and supporting their family. Um, other than that, I mean, yeah, to, to, like Joe said, uh, in all this chaos and uh, unprecedented time and uh, newness of operation, uh, we had such an incredible increase in demand. I mean, in South Africa, in March, April, and May, we had a 75%, 103%, and 59% higher sales consecutively than last year over the same period. So um, a tremendous increase in demand, uh, which was which was awesome. But then there were um, the challenges of getting raw materials. We had a, our RAND, um, which was depreciating uh, quite, quite badly um, at the start of the crisis and, and hasn't recovered. So we are importing a lot of our raw materials um, and that's been challenging, you know, because it's, it's affected the pricing of the products. So they've been more expensive, right? Um, and what about in terms of, so you mentioned the demand in South Africa. Can you say anything about the demand, uh, for example, in the, the UK um, and other yeah. places? Yeah, I mean, if so everywhere. It, we, we saw similar, similar growth everywhere, uh, about 50% in the UK, about 40% in Australia, quite a lot of out of stocks in Australia, unfortunately, and um, we're trying to find our feet again. Uh, we do have a new facility which is coming online, which will treble our output, um, and that facility will, will come online in October, so it will help us deal with that demand. But um, yeah, it, it's, there's been a lot going on at Fries since, since March, that's for sure. It's Sounds been like it, yeah. <laughs> it's heartening to hear, though, certainly, and I know we're going to get on to, to some of the others who are in the non-food-based space, but great to hear that, uh, you know, the demand and, and sales have been up for vegan and plant-based products. I think that's really heartening. Um, so, Rimi and Manaf, uh, so I guess some sort of similar, I guess some of your products are similar to Adrian in that they're kind of they're confectionery type snack um, uh, products um, can you talk to us and I believe you you don't manufacture them yourselves but you um, you use a, a manufacturing uh, facility so can you talk to us a little bit about what happened there and and how that impacted how the whole COVID situation has impacted your business yeah sure I think um, very similar to Adrian we were seeing what was happening internationally and we sort of had a meeting a couple of weeks before and said look if it goes in the UK it looks like it will go into lockdown it, may, it will need to to, you know, to and so we basically made a lot of stock in March. We because we thought the fact because we don't own the factory, it could shut down if there was a breakout. We didn't know what the regulations were going to be, so we made a lot of stock for about two three months buffer stock just in case. That was the the first thing that we did, and I think a week before we had a meeting and we've decided that everybody was going to work from home. So we sent everybody with their computers and everything we've set up is cloud based anyway. So it was very easy. To to start working the next day, take your computer home. And we came back and then we were just on Google Hangouts and meetings and chatting and stuff like that. But, you know, we did have to re-strategize the business because we did have a very good March, April. But we noticed that, you know, supermarkets, it was going down a bit because food to go, people were buying lunches and stuff. So we ended up shifting very much online. You know, we sort of changed the business, changed a couple of roles temporarily. And I think, well, we used to do about one order a day in February. And I think it peaked to about 200 orders a day. Wow. From your website. So, so direct to customers yeah. from your website. Yeah. Wow. But wow. we really, really went big on online and we went thought, you know what, it's an opportunity now for us to sort of grow our awareness of the brand, you know, because we didn't know what was going to happen. We're in a bit of grocery. We're in a lot of the independent health food shops and we weren't sure how it was, how it was going to go. And then I think it was, the good decision to make on the short term basis for Love Raw to focus on online. And then, you know, and then we're seeing now after a few months, Waitrose, etc., the orders are starting to increase again. I think, you know, chocolate wasn't a 
you know, a necessity product like the toilet roll or frozen food. So it was, it was a bit interesting to see. It declined in stores but increased online. Yeah, and consumer behaviour, um, you know, everybody went into panic and they were initially kind of buying the kind of dried stocks such as, you know, sauces and pasta. And then it kind of went in phases. So when they had enough of this, then, then it went on to, um, you know, biscuits um, and, you know, confectionery. And, and, and then it kind of, um, you know, stabilised a little bit. So it was almost they prioritised what they needed the most and then stocked up on this. And then what they felt they, you know, could, um, you know, wait on, you know, such as, uh, you know, luxury items, such as confectionery. I know with some people it's a necessity. With yeah, some I was going to say, I bet there's some people watching going, no, chocolate's definitely a necessity. Luxury, <laughs> you know, in comparison to, you know, dried goods. Um, yeah. so, so we saw it, the, the kind of demand shift in those phases. And then, you know, as, as Maud have mentioned, you know, as a brand, we've always said, you know, we belong in the impulse aisle, in the food to food to go. So, you know, we, we didn't really want to be pe- placed in free from. Um, and as buyers requirements, you know, are changing as well. So, you know, we've really worked hard to get into certain bays such as food to go. And then with, with you know, with, with COVID, uh, with offices, you know, closing down and, um, you know, the, the footfall decreasing, I guess the free from aisle was more, you know, prevalent rather than the food to go. And the food to go and the impulse, they had a huge drop. I think, you know, with one multiple, you know, sixty percent down. Wow. So, so I guess we were yes, affected in in, in those terms. But I, I, if I was going to look for a positive that came out of everything, we've we've hired people during the lockdown, and you know, we've hired some people very recently, and I've noticed that with a lot of people applying for jobs. They've had time to reflect on where they're working, what type of business they want, and what type of impact they want to have on the world or their family or whatever it is. So, you know, we've made some really great hires recently because people have decided to, you know, want to change in career, you know, if they're lucky to have that and they really want to make an impact. So, you know, it's it's a very interesting time. And it was, it was very much kind of we continue. I mean, it, it was hard work trying to continue at home with the kids. And um, and we had new hires that had were onboarded virtually, you know. Uh, so and and they they came on board and, and now they're in the office with us. So um, you know, we we it it was hard work. I guess yeah. Marlev, um was there daily, you know, keeping everybody's um, spirits motivated. up and keeping them motivated. And everybody was good. The team didn't down tools or anything. So we were very lucky. Fantastic. You mentioned about the, the, the impulse section that, that, that kind of went down. So were you able to switch your products back into the free from aisle then, or does it not happen that, that quickly? No, no, it happen that quickly, but it's made us think about our strategy and, right, you know, gotcha. forward because if people are working from home, we found in our building, there's, you know, there's about 20 offices, 20 companies, but only three are back. The rest aren't coming yes. back till January. Yeah. So the, if you go to Boots and, their food to go is dead. There's nothing there. So we've, you know, we've had to do a bit of re- re-strategizing and yeah. looking about where we sit going forward. And hopefully there will, there'll be some changes. Gotcha. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So we've, we've gone through the food, some of the food uh, businesses. So I'd like to go to Sue next because now obviously, you know, your, your company, produce, you, you sell hair care, skin care, personal care. So those are still pretty much essential items. Obviously yours are, you know, they're not just the kind of cheap and nasties with all the, the chemicals, they're natural, they're, all, they're organic. So um, I'm curious, how did the, the COVID situation, how has that impacted your business and, and the sales? Okay, well, basically, um, when it all started kicking off, we noticed that there was a sudden spike in sales. And we think this is very much to do with a little bit of panic buying in a way, um, both with consumers and with our retail stockists. And normally where somebody would perhaps go in and buy one tube of our Hopes Relief Intensive Rescue Cream, um, they were buying two or three. So in... um, the beginning of this our sales rocketed and as a result we went out of stock of a few of the lines but we managed to very quickly replenish these Uh, we also noticed that our freight costs suddenly went up um, and we've absorbed these so we didn't pass them on at all to any of our customers 
Wow. Okay. So when you say, cause, cause I noticed you say you import um, like some of your products from across the globe. And obviously, you know, there were situations were different in different countries in terms of the, the COVID-19. So you, you said you were able to easily replenish. So were you able to easily replenish those same products or did you have to kind of look elsewhere for kind of re- replacements or, and did you find that it took longer for things to come in as well? We managed to find um, different ways of um, getting the products here. So like, for instance, one of the airlines that we were using, they suddenly were grounded and we had to very quickly source another way of bringing it over with a different airline. So we had issues like that, but we managed to remedy them with a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Gotcha, gotcha. Now you mentioned, uh, uh, Rimi and Manaf mentioned that their uh, their e-commerce uh, sales skyrocketed compared to, um, uh, you know, the retail uh, sales. Did you find that with, with yours or how did that sort of, how did that compare the e-commerce versus um, your products being sold in retailers? I think when people were literally buying panic buying and stocking up we had a massive growth in sales it then went very much quieter when there was this risk of whether health food stores were going to remain open as essential businesses or not and when it was announced again the sales started going up so year on year we've had big growth both directly into our stores um, but also with our e-commerce that we stock for other people's e-commerce and our own e-commerce. Um, a lot of these independent retailers weren't really focusing very much on their e-commerce. So we had to give a little gentle nudge and persuasion uh, about how important it is that you've got to find other ways of selling these products and getting it out to the consumer. So we encouraged them to use their social media a lot more. Um, even some of them are launching their own websites, which isn't a very quick and easy thing to do. Uh, but we literally had it happening on all different platforms all at once. <laughs> wow, <laughs> certainly a busy time. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to go to Laura because I think out of all our panelists, we can't really say, we can't really argue that a vegan watch is a, a necessary item. I mean, yours is a it's a fashion item. It's uh, you know they're amazing. They're beautiful quality. We've got one. Uh, my partner Tracy's got one. Um, they are a a luxury, a nice to have. So I'm really curious how has this whole situation affected Botch? Yeah, of course. Well, we were naturally, um, going on what you've just said, very, very nervous in the beginning. Um, we work in, out of Asia, so we were obviously seeing the situation as it unfolded firsthand there. Um, and also just the week prior to going lockdown, we'd secured investment, which was really great and really exciting for us. And then the next week later, we were in lockdown with a two-year-old and no childcare. So we had to really... Um, focus in and really strategize as to how we were going to make this work. Also, our fulfillment center is based here in the UK. We weren't sure because obviously we don't run and manage the fulfillment center if they were going to stay open, if they were going to close. Um, They chose to remain open, which was great, so we could still ship orders. Um, We saw a little... um, a little delay in parcels and shipping going to customers but other than that customers were aware of you know the situation and really um you know sympathetic to the situation but sales overall over that whole period have been up 60 percent this year than last year wow um, we invested a lot more into online marketing uh, because obviously we knew people were at home scrolling looking uh, and and we could target customers that way um, we appointed a new digital media agency we strategized and um, really worked on our key messaging um, and also even though watches aren't an essential item they are quite a key gifting item so mm-hmm. while people couldn't obviously be with loved ones etc we were able to include like personalized notes etc um, so that was a really nice touch that we were able to include um, for our customers so on the whole it's really just allowed us to kind of focus and where we're going to go next and the next level because I think you know this is we said the beginning of you know a long process and we really need to diversify re-strategize and make sure we're bringing out products that are going to suit us for the longer term now that isn't necessarily just watches so we are having a lot of consideration now on what our our future offering is going to be in this time but overall you know we're we're surviving and and it's doing okay the team's growing um we most of my team work from home anyway quite big in um hiring mums in the workplace to allow them for flexible hours from working from home so yeah everyone's just really really kind of helping each other out and watching 
um yeah just supporting each other but we have placed an order way more in advance than we would usually do for the christmas period because um for example plating factories were closed down um, a, a huge huge amount of um, plating factories are shut down and some factories aren't over in the ancient general manufacturer have reopened or they're asking for big wrap pump um upfront payments on um initial orders because so many of their orders have been cancelled but fortunately we've been quite lucky our factory's still going still functioning um so yeah i feel like we're we've we've survived so far and hoping to yeah. do so for the remaining period of this yeah wow i love that i'm, I'm very i must say i'm very heartened by particularly this panel i was wondering if we were going to get any horror stories but it's all been really quite positive i'm curious what you said though laurie you said that your that one of your factories chose to remain open i find that interesting the only reason i say that is my partner tracy likes to dance and she she likes to have vegan point shoes so she's been getting them from like gainer minden and there's another one one, another brand a, a Russian brand that do Grishka that do vegan shoes all their factories because they were based like some of them were in Italy and Europe like they they just closed like they had to close and they're not yeah. opening so it's kind of interesting that I I'm curious that yours were able to choose to stay open because oh. I know with the others they were classed as essential like the food ones how did yeah. that no, factories had to close. So fa factories were closed because in Asia, it was our fulfillment centre here. They're the ones because they were shipping. They were classed as being able to still stay open. Oh, um, okay, gotcha. Government guidelines here saying that they had to close. Um, so it, it was in their hands. We were all ready to go up and go and collect all the stock and bring it all back oh. to the home and ship from here. But they were they were able to remain under the government guidelines. So, um, so what impact did the factory closing? Did that have any impact, the fact that the factory had to close for a while? We're, we're out of stock of some of our best sellers. Um, right, yeah, right, we have right. been. We, we, we also kind of coincided with a sale and free strap orders to kind of try and, you know, increase our offering and increase sales during this time. So some of our best sellers have been out of stock. That's been unavoidable. And that's the situation. But we've just been really um, kind of hands on. One of, uh, one of our teams will make up the watches by hand. We'll send components. And we'll, 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 we'll jiggle bits around when we've buckles and move straps and do what we've got to do to make sure that that what we can sell can be selling so yeah, yeah. brilliant oh, I love that I love that fantastic so thank you all for sharing that with kind of the general sort of overview of how how COVID-19 has, has impacted your businesses I'm curious about what's been the impact on and we, some I know one or two of you have touched on this what's been the impact on new product development like has that been put on hold and was it a case of just trying to kind of get existing stock out out the door to kind of keep sales in so I'm just curious about um about new product development Development. let's go back to adrian well new product development has been something that we've been forging ahead with and um parts of the we we have two new ranges coming out um one of them was uh halfway through development and the other one um was bubbling under the surface so we were actually able to uh do quite a lot um of product development because of course a lot of the time uh, product development is uh is uh, time of thought as well as um, experimentations and all those type of things. Um, and so there is this delicate balance of what can we do, where can we go, but we're very excited. We will be launching a new range um, in September that's, uh, that's coming out and everything is all of the packaging has been done and it's all um, uh, paper packaging of chocolate, which is absolutely fantastic, you know, zero plastic, um, because this is a, you know, plastic is, is, is still a big issue. And there are lots of issues where COVID has taken over that uh, that will remain for a longer time than COVID, such as plastic. Um, so that is uh, one line we've been looking at. And um, another line which will be coming out early next year. So actually the product development um, has gone unabated. So we're pleased that um, really that, that hasn't affected us at all, the, the, the COVID situation, because in a sense, it has almost given us more breathing space um, to, to develop those ones that were bubbling under the surface. But I think what really happens now is analyzing where the market is going to go, because clearly, as, as we've heard, you know, the food to go sector um, is suffered quite substantially. Um, and there's lots of market areas. So, so to develop a product that specifically goes into one market area could be a mistake because you never know when that is going to be taken from under you in, in a sense. So to really um, look at long-term strategies to develop products, but maybe also long-term strategies to take some products out of the range, 
because in manufacturing you have to become uh, leaner um, and uh, more efficient. So um, the demands there, in, in, because the costs of manufacturing have, have gone up substantially uh, because of all the extra things. So you, you, you're looking also to maybe take out a, f a few of the range and replace them with a few others. So it becomes a long-term strategy rather than just, well, what else can we do? What new products can be done? And um, we think that's important, um, how people are going to be eating at home, you know, are they, how they're going to be snacking, are they going to be sharing, are they going to be indulgent moments? Um, what are the essential foods going to be? How are they going to be viewed? What are the flavours coming along? Um, and there's a number of flavours that have been bubbling under the surface as well. So they're all ones to look at. So in, in all the, the COVID situation, I think there's been um, a neutral uh, on existing product development, but does change the medium and long term look into what is required, what is needed. And, and we're, we're actually pleased we were working with two or three other companies in lockdown um, to actually have products that were going to be launched maybe at the end of this year. Now they're going to be uh, launched um, next year, for instance. So that has taken uh, time, but that gives a longer development. Um, and just so that uh, longer time lead times are needed. We're lucky we've even gained some brand new customers come to us over this time with, with some new products on short term development. They've said, can you produce this in this format or that format? And we've been actually able to do that for them in lockdown and supply a product. Um, so that is really, really good. So that, uh, that just shows that, that while lockdown has happened, that, that there are opportunities to be had. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to say we've taken a, a advantage of all those opportunities because while some people we supply have, have literally sort of halved or quartered, others have doubled and trebled. Mm -hmm. So it is a swings and balances and it's part of our also our long term strategy, a good vegan term, don't put all your eggs in one basket really, <laughs> um, have a diverse business, you know, I don't know what the vegan term is for that. Maybe um, I've been saying avocados, don't put all your avocados, avocados yeah, in yeah, basket. <laughs> <laughs> so really the strategy is not to have uh, a concentration of your sales, but to have a little bit here, have a product there, have a little bit there. Uh, and in that way, you have a diverse business, which is, is yeah. we have learned from, from being the original vegan company and, and going through all the times where vegan in products weren't on the shelf is to be diverse, to um, not um, be selling solely one thing or another, but try and do a whole range of different products. And you, you, because you never know what's around the corner, you never know when, when the next uh, storm is going to come. And that's part of um, our strategy in the long term, and it has been part of our strategy that that we've really learnt, and, and why I think we've been quite resilient over the uh, COVID times is because you know plan for the rainy day. You never know when it's going to happen. And, um, you know, and it happened quite heavily, didn't it? It, it certainly badly. did. It so, poured. <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, but, but be prepared for these times. Don't always assume tomorrow is going to be exactly the same as today. And I think that's probably a big take home. We need to, we need to all learn, really. And, uh, and we're just starting that process as, as much as anybody. And, and that, that goes in for our uh, long term uh, product development. Yeah, I think that's good to hear, especially from such a, you know, a business that's been around for so long, such as yours, is that you, you know, you were pioneers. And, you know, at one point, you probably were like almost the only vegan chocolate brand at one point, but you've obviously seen so much change. I mean, you have to constantly kind of keep changing and diversifying. So I think that that's really great advice. Joe, as a, a, a frozen pizza brand, you've got some amazing um, uh, products on there. I was, I was having a look before we came on again, it's making me hungry. I'm like, I want one of these, but you can't <laughs> ship them all the way over here yet. How has that been in, 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 in terms of new product development for you have you did you kind of already like have a certain amount and you're kind of like okay we're just going to stick with that or have you been working on new product development at all yeah it's actually been a, a really exciting space for us the mpd side so um we've never been uh, known particularly well for a, a mpd we've we've just had the four core flavors and the last four or five years has, has been all about brand awareness um getting into some of the you know, getting into some of the multiples, some of the retailers, um, and, and just improving those four pizzas, making sure they're as strong as they can be. Um, but Mike had some brilliant foresight, which um, he never lets me forget. And he, he actually <laughs> he encouraged us to, to launch our, our D2C uh, website and do a, a, 
a total rebuild of that uh, and offer nationwide home delivery. And it was the UK's first ever um, nationwide home delivery service of frozen plant-based pizza. And um, so that was really exciting and pioneering stuff. Um, and that's now our, our whole website is, is based around this e-commerce platform. So you can now order our pizzas and have them delivered sustainably in recycled compostable packaging and they'll arrive at your door frozen. And that's anywhere in the UK. Um, and, and I wasn't too excited about that back in January because I wanted to, I wanted to focus on getting into Waitrose or Sainsbury's, um, getting into more wholesalers and food service. And Mike was always pushing. He had this feeling. It was really interesting that we should get online and everything is going digital. And then it just so happens that, um, you know, soon after when we weren't really giving it much attention, we'd got the website ready and we, we were sort of putting maybe 10% of our time into it. Um, obviously, you know, we started hearing about lockdown happening and, um, and everything else. And, and it was just perfect that we had that head start. So we, we suddenly put about 50% of our time and energy and, and spend into the website. Um, we created this whole uh, platform where you could personalize your pizzas. You could choose your base, choose your flavors. Uh, we created a few new flavors, which we'd been working on for about a year, but hadn't had an opportunity to sell them. Um, so yeah, we launched that in January and it, it was uh, perfect timing for lockdown. It's been really successful and, and really good fun because we've, we've been able to then, you know, directly engage with our customers rather than go through various channels, you know, wholesale, retail, where we don't have that really great relationship with them. And we're, we're very much a sort of purpose-driven uh, brand with a really nice story. Um, so being able to, to engage directly with customers and, you know, respond to what flavors they're asking for and, and uh, do really brilliant collaborations, um, that's been a really exciting space for us. So we, Fantastic. yeah, sorry, I disappeared because I wanted to grab the OPP Direct box for you guys. So, um, yeah, this is, it has... Um, a cardboard yeah recycled cardboard is the insulation that goes inside then we use a little bit of dry ice but it's not really been done at all before um and i don't we, we've only found one other company that's ever done it in europe that you can have frozen pizzas delivered to your door um so that's been really exciting and, and then on top of that we launched a, a really big collaboration with meatless farm so sorry if that's reversed but this is <laughs> our um we now think this is our best ever pizza which is the cheeseburger pizza and uh, oh, wow. this is a big partnership with the Meatless Farm Co. Uh, we use their burger chunks alongside lots of other toppings that you would expect to find on a cheeseburger. Um, and again, that's, that's never been done before in the vegan world. So, so that's, um, that's quite exciting that we were the first to do that. And you, you can now get that anywhere in the UK. We're, we're just about to launch it on the vegan kind. And, uh, and we're trying to get it listed with uh, one of the multiples as well through the Meatless Farm because they're a little bit bigger than us and they can help us uh, get a foot in the door. Um, so yeah, MPD has wow. been really exciting and um, we've just launched a Mexicana, which is in collaboration with um, the guys over at Norstant, who are one of the biggest yeah. dairy cheese companies oh. in the UK. So we're, right. we're trying yeah. to help them go more plant-based. So that's um, sort of part of our mission as well is teaming up with bigger non-vegan brands and saying, well, actually this is a really fast growing, exciting area. Um, in the food industry and, and we'll help you guys get in there and let's do some exciting flavors and and encourage them to do more brilliant vegan foods wonderful i love that i'm love hearing about this innovation it actually leads me nicely on to tammy because uh curious about obviously about new product development in regards to fries but also you i know you and i have talked because tammy and i are friends i know we've talked about how you know being a, an independent family brand for so long there was only so far you could get and then these big corporates are coming in so you actually um uh, joined the live kindly group which is an umbrella group of, of other plant-based meat companies so is there anything you can say about how it how has that helped fries in terms of being able to uh, broaden out you know get to a bigger market and and also around potential new product development yeah thanks katrina um you know, we we also we we I guess we are one of the pioneers in the plant based meat section sectors because um, we were founded in 1991 in South Africa where there were I don't think there were any vegans in South Africa at the time. Um, <laughs> a handful. <laughs> um, while you said he contacted the Vegetarian Society back in 1991, and there were ten members of the Vegetarian Society, so um, definitely a, a company born out of purpose and passion. Um, and really just actually trying to answer 
uh, or, or give ourselves a solution um, because we were plant-based. And so that's how it all started. Um, what happens with uh, these these older companies is you you develop a range that people really enjoy. Um, and then as technologies um, advance, uh, you want to launch new products, but then people are still loving the old products. So you end up with more and more product SKUs. And we now have a portfolio of over 50 different plant-based meats. Um, and, and as Adrian says, you have to sometimes cut, cut the older ones despite the fact that people are still enjoying them, but because you know you have to bring new technologies to market because if you want to compete and you want to, and you want flexitarians to, to move into the space um, and you want to compete with some of the biggest uh, corporate companies that are all entering the space at, at unprecedented rates um, with huge uh, wallets, um, you know, you have to make some tough decisions. And I think for us, you know, as a family, we knew how to make so many incredible products, so many and very advanced technology products because we had, we had 30 years of experience. Um, and we wanted to bring these products to market, but the capital investments um, for the size of company that we had become, you know, we now supply 28 countries worldwide um, and over 25,000 outlets um, that stock our products. So to now have the capital just as a small, as just as a family um, was becoming more and more challenging. And, and we, we made that decision to, to join with Live Kindly um, and have access to that capital. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of corporates that, that did very big corporates that knocked on our door. And um, we just needed to find people that were value aligned. And that's the great thing about the Live Kindly Collective is it's a collective of only plant-based, 100% plant-based brands. So when we have discussions, we are all 100% aligned and uh, we, ha we share the same value system. We share the same purpose. So that made it easier for us to take that next step as a family. And um, yeah, as far as the as, as NPD goes, we are now so excited because we're bringing new alternative proteins to market. We have, um, we, we are now able to invest in that machinery and equipment to produce those products that we had been dreaming about being able to produce and take to market. And so you're gonna see some very incredible, awesome, innovative products coming from Fry's over the next um, six months. Uh, yeah. One of our very most recent launches was the Big Fry Burger, oh, um, yes. which my son thinks that he named actually, so he's claiming it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's, it's doing incredibly well um, wherever it's been launched. Um, it's a raw, and that's a frozen. That's a frozen product. Um, I mean, is frozen it? or chilled, ideally chilled, but oh. but it is being sold in some regions where where the chill is not an option for it to be sold. For example, in South Africa, that market that the chilled plant based market is not established enough, and um, so it's being sold in the freezer. But it is a raw, um, a raw product, so it requires a little more cooking. It gives that whole meat experience. Um, you know, it's got that red. Uh, you want to say it bleeds. It doesn't, it's, it's not a bleeding <laughs> burger, but it has, it looks like a raw burger, which sizzles and has, you know, 20 grams of protein per patty. Um, and, and very, one of the things we're really proud of is that when we produce products, we, we have almost no additives. So when we do comparisons across all different meat analogs, fries is probably one of the cleanest uh, meat alternatives on the market. And I think that's because you know, we eat our products every day and my children eat our products. And so we choose our ingredients very carefully because when you're eating it, um, you want to know that you're eating good food. Uh, so it's, it's very important to us as a family. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's where we are as far as NPD goes. I'm super excited for everyone to see what we've been up to. And since we joined Live Kindly and we have all that new energy and, it's 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 an awesome time ahead for us. I think. I hope. I love that. I'm loving all the collaborations. I think it's so important. And I think you know, for mission driven businesses, you know, because we're more than just about making sales. Of course, we want to make sales, make a profit to be sustainable. But I love that we're on that broader mission. And when we come together, so much can be achieved. So I hope that's really inspiring for, for people watching, which is wonderful. Um, Rimi and Manav, did you want to say anything at all about, I know you've talked a little bit about how you pivoted, anything around new product development on your front or how, how it's been impacted? Yeah, I mean, we, 
we did launch a product in March, um, just before um, COVID and, and lockdown hit. And, you know, we put everything in place to, you know, do a big launch and then, and then COVID hit. So I guess in, in, in that terms, it was unfortunate for us because I guess, again, consumer behavior, they, they, consumers wanted to buy something that they know and that, that they're familiar with. So the new product that we had launched, um, you know, did have a low rate of sale. And, you know, we almost have to relaunch that again in the coming months because we don't feel it had that opportunity um, to launch as well as it could have. Um, we were working on a new product to launch in, in May, um, around May. And, you know, we can do so much our side and move forward with it. But then we had limitations of factories and, you know, um, them, they closing down and, you know, they maybe they weren't open for a few weeks. And, and so um, it was just waiting on kind of, you know, other, other parts of the business, you know, that was holding us back. But we are going ahead and, and launching um, in September. And, you know, it, it resonated a lot with what Adrian was saying, um, you know, just diversifying. And whereas before, I think every, you know, you always think by getting into the multiples, you'll, you know, you'll have that kind of high rate of sale. But I think, you know, you've got various elements where you can sell, you know, out of home and convenience and D2C and the multiples. So I think it is about just diversifying across all of those channels and do you want to tell the product so first of september but it's a world's first in vegan chocolate <laughs> oh so adrian you've got competition <laughs> what is it it's very, it's very innovative. innovative it's very innovative um we've had a fantastic um feedback from buyers and um yeah we're, we're going to be kind of hitting stores in september so you can't say what is it top secret at the moment? You can't tell us yeah, what it is. Give us a I can't keep everybody. So but I can say weeks, no, no, uh, first of September. Yeah. When first is of there? September. Okay, we'll <laughs> keep an eye out. Well, we're looking forward to that. Brilliant. And um, Laura, I know you you briefly did touch on new product development. You said you were kind of getting quite creative because of um, the factories closing down. Is there anything you wanted to add just on new product development? Thank yeah, you, Jimmy. I think um, the vegan fashion space, despite COVID, is still growing massively. I mean, um, the uh, the vegan leather market set to take over the animal-based um, leather market in, by 2025. So there's wow. such a big space for us there to work with. I love um, that. <laughs> really, really exciting. And it's not when we first launched four years ago. It was very much about vegan fashion. But obviously, it's all about sustainability now as well. And there are so many new materials coming out, um, incorporating bio waste, like cactus and Apple, etc. So we're doing a lot of innovation and um, experimenting here, and yeah, we're launching a completely new product. Um, hopefully, in the next two months to hit the Christmas market. But we're really, we're really diversifying into other accessories, and that's what COVID's kind of given us. And with our investment um, and trying all these new materials, a real scope to really branch out on our current offerings. So yeah, it's a really exciting time for us to wonderful silver linings. I'm loving them. And um, Sue, I don't know. Does I'm not sure if Mahi now do you actually make any of your own products or do, is new product development um is that applicable to your business or is it more you're kind of working with other brands to to sell their new products is there anything you want to add on new product development yes we we actually do have one of our very own brands which is called Skinworks. um this is um a superfood facial oil for the skin so we do have that as our own brand but we've got quite a diverse portfolio of brands um going from oral dental care which is woo bamboo we've got crazy rumor lip balms which are 100 percent natural and vegan these are very good at the moment because obviously people are wearing masks are getting dry lips so um, this is a very good seller uh hopes relief again which is natural skin care we've also got biocap which is a vegan rapid home hair color brand so this is one of our highly topical brands um, our other highly topical brand, uh, again, is you know going to be Hope's Relief. We also have Imani, vegan cosmetics. A lot of people are buying products perhaps to try that they've never tried before. Um, so we've diversed a little bit more, and we've actually launched two brands in July, which is incredible. Uh, one of these is JR Liggett's, which is a solid shampoo bar range. 
Um, and the other one is Bass Brushes. These are amazing. They're a range of bamboo brushes and biodegradable. So we've literally got a diverse range from oral to hair to skincare to makeup. Yeah, so it, NPD, as far as that goes, is us sourcing new brands mm. um, very much to build on our portfolio. So we've taken advantage of the time and done this as well. Lovely. So I'm hearing a lot of diversification um, is really coming from, from all of us, which is wonderful. Before I carry on with any more questions, I know we have got an audience question. So I'm just going to read that out. So it's from Humane Wildlife Solutions. I know you guys. This is, hi, Katrina. Hope you're well. Thank you. Still honoured to have been part of your Vegan Ventures book. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. He says, my question is, do, so this is to the panels, uh, do all your businesses find it hard to overcome wildlife conflicts, otherwise known in the real world as pet control uh, when they arise and have you seen a rise in cases over lockdown who'd like to start with that you can just raise your hand and we can unmute and shall i start with that adrian yeah go for it i think one of the biggest things about uh, pest control is 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 prevention um and if you're talking about anything uh, such as pests and controlling them, what, what you've actually done is lost the battle to start with. And what you really need to be doing is, uh, is, is looking at the environment that the, the site is on and preventing um, things coming in, for instance. Uh, and it's a, a lesson that I think any, uh, any pest control contractor will tell you is, 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 is your biggest defense is, is prevention. And um, so that is, a, that is going to be a, a big part of whatever you do um we actually um in the middle of lockdown are looking to demolish a building and um very interestingly enough um what happens is a bat survey is 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 required for that and people come along and do a bat survey and um see all the type of wildlife and um Actually, you know, there were four guys there and they said, do you know what? This has been one of the most boring nights ever. We haven't seen anything. <laughs> um, and that's partly because, you know, it, it, it's about preventing things rather than uh, having to control them. And, and I think that's that's the big lesson that everybody has. So I think there is there is a conflict. Um, but the conflict is is is, well, keep the door shut to start with. Mm, got it. Thank you. Um, anyone else like to chime in on that? Joe, anything to add on that i haven't got too much interesting uh, too many interesting things to say about that i'm afraid no we've always been quite lucky we had a, a purpose-built kitchen uh, just behind our office here um the worst we've ever had is now we've got a wasp's nest but that keeps away any unwanted guests and that's not much of a problem we don't have to they're not coming into the kitchen area to the the high risk areas they're just outside um that's about as much activity as we've had out here Right. Um, uh, Tammy, any thoughts on that? Because obviously, given you've got your factory in South Africa, are there any issues around, around yeah. that? Yeah, well, we have a purpose-built food factory and um, anyone who runs a food factory will understand that, you know, there's no windows. It's a, a very sanitized environment. Um, there's no pests going to get in there <laughs> at all. <laughs> so there's no, there's no openings for for animals or creatures to to enter the facility the only way they would come in is with raw materials and that's um you know of course before all all raw materials are inspected before they even enter into the raw material holding uh, facility so um you, you you shouldn't you know inside a food factory you should you should not have uh, pests as, as adrian said if you do you've already lost the battle and and you probably don't have a food safe factory in the first place. So mm. I, I, nobody wants to find a fly in their fries burger. I, I can promise you. <laughs> yeah, very true, <laughs> it, very true. Especially the vegans. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Well, that's good to hear. So I hope that's answered your question, Kevin. Thank you for that. Um, it's great to hear from you. And thank you for your question. And again, if anyone else has got any questions, uh, do type them into the Q&A panel. Um, we've got probably around about another 20 minutes or so. So we'll keep an eye out. If you've got questions, do put them in. And I'm happy to, to open that up to, to, that, uh, to our panel. Um, so in the meantime, 
so just wanted to talk about, I know some of you, particularly those of you who deal with wholesalers, uh, distributors and retailers, I'm wondering whether, because typically we know that the margins are often tight, um, you know, and particularly when it comes to the big supermarket chains, uh, you know, they can, uh, can kind of squeeze, um, you know, independent brands in terms of the, the, the profit margin, etc. I'm wondering whether you've seen any kind of difference in your relationships between those parties, given the, the COVID-19 situation, like have they sort of made any uh, concessions or in any way or given you any, any benefits in any way at all? Who'd like to kick off with that? Tammy, I know you deal with big supermarkets. Maybe we'll start with you on this one. Um, well, you know, Katrina, because the plant-based space is such an active space at the moment, I think um, at the end of the day, retailers exist for primarily one thing, and that's money. And um, uh, you can't, you know, no one can eat a shelf, an empty shelf. So if you can't supply and there are 10, 15, maybe 20, or even 30 brands um, lined up that can supply, the retailer is likely to just shift to another brand. Um, even though you've had a long-term relationship with them. So it is pretty, it's a very hard environment to um, be a part of and, and you have to, you just have to keep supplying. There, there's no real excuses. It, it doesn't matter what excuse you have because there's another brand that doesn't have the same excuse as you do. So um, it is tricky. You, you've just got to, you've got to make sure that you you plan for, for everything and you make sure that you've got stock and you've got holding stock um, and, and you're ready to, con to have continuous supply. There, there's not, I, I don't know if anyone else has any other experience, but um, mainstream retail is, is a tough, uh, independent might be completely different, um, uh, but for sure, mainstream retail. And of course, at the moment, food service is almost non-existent. So we, we've had almost, you know, we've lost maybe 90% of sales in, in food service because restaurants and quick service restaurants are all closed. So um, that, that's our experience. Uh, and I, I don't know if anyone else has had a different experience. Mm. Uh, Rimi and Manav, I believe you, you're stocked in some of the, the bigger chains. Any, anything you'd like to say on that? Yeah, I, I guess initially, um, the buyers, they were so inundated with their categories and even sharing other categories, um, covering on behalf of their colleagues. So it's almost like I didn't want to bother them too much because I know that they had a lot on, um, you know, in the first couple of months. But then, you know, uh, you know from uh, end of April, you know, May onwards, I think they were more receptive um, because as, you know, things kind of um, unfold in um, the, the multiples, they still want to have new products um, coming up. And, and, and so, you know, they were more kind of open to, you know, listening, you know, to, to what we have to offer. But, with distributors. Sorry, go on. Oh, yeah, with yeah. distributors, they were a lot more flexible and understanding. But okay. from conversations that Rimi was having with buyers and stuff like that in the supermarkets, they're still no, they haven't changed. They're the same as Tammy, as Tammy has said. They haven't, they haven't reflected on anything on how they deal with you. Their attitude's still very the same, very mm -hmm. cutthroat, blunt, and direct, and high expectations. You know, so I think that's what. I, I found from being with speaking to some of them yeah and yeah, some of them were well. furloughed as well but they didn't tell you that was very interesting you could tell yeah, yeah. you could you could tell because they just <laughs> in such a long, long time. time um yeah annually so it was just i think they're still the same the the main buyers retail buyers boots Holland and Barra, yeah, et cetera. And, and then it, and then it varies, you know, with the distributors. Yeah. You know, we supply quite a lot of independence too. Um, but you they know, were they, 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 they were supportive. You know, it was positive, and they kept open. So it was very different. Um, and yeah. as, as you were saying on the the food service, that yeah. that literally just um, collapsed <laughs> overnight. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Thank I you. I think very we need much, to remember yeah. that uh, that uh, all, of course all all the food businesses are all having their own 
individual problems of distribution and supply. So there were people on furloughs, there were people not working, working from home. And we all had to recognise that they were all struggling themselves in doing what they normally do and coming to uh, to going forward. So we recognise mm-hmm. that, that you know there will be different strategies with different buyers and different companies. And uh, and I think it was it was an interesting time to see how different companies reacted. Yeah. And, and a learning yeah. experience for, for for everybody in dealing with them. I think from us, one of the one of the strangest things was having a online Zoom audits. Um, by customers, oh, you really? know, things, uh, things that were really, really different where normally people would come to site and audit you. They would do everything by um, Zoom and things <laughs> like that. So that was really, really different from uh, from uh, yeah, dealing with buyers and uh, companies. Indeed. Thank you. Now, we've got a couple of audience questions. So uh, my hope I can pronounce that right. Mahesh Anishma. Oh, of Shambhu's. Hello. Um, Dave asking, uh, have you made any special preparations or provisions given the anticipated long-term deep recession? I know, Adrian, you touched on that a little bit earlier about long-term strategies, but um, would anyone else like to chime in on that in terms of, because we are living, it is very uncertain. I mean, yes, we've had a lockdown, but now, you know, there's potential second, maybe third. We we really don't know where we're going. So any of you want to touch on that on any of the the plans you're making um joe yeah you just need to unmute yourself yeah i, know, I don't want to make that mistake no one's done it yet i don't want to do it first <laughs> um yeah yeah i mean so we are quite a premium product and we would sit at the top in terms of price um which we justify you know through quality through flavor through packaging um but if and when we do head into a recession and um, people want to spend less, then we, one of the things we are doing is we, go, we are going through a bit of a rebrand at the moment, uh, looking at the key messages on the front of the boxes, um, you know, what's important to the consumers, that's changing. And, and, and one of the big factors for us is the price point. So we're with Ocado at the moment and five wholesalers who have all been really supportive and, and the orders have been fairly... Um, fairly consistent since lockdown uh, and they've been very helpful and flexible but now we're we're approaching the the bigger multiples we're, we're reaching out to to all the major supermarkets and, and ready hopefully for a january listing somewhere um but the price always comes up and i think this will be a, a bigger issue for consumers if we do go into a recession so there are things we can do when we expand our, our prices will go down because of the scales of economy naturally so uh, that's really helpful, but we're also thinking about ways we can we can look at our supplies of the ingredients without impacting the quality and and what we're doing in terms of our production line. Uh, installing a conveyor belt is is one of our big plans to to reduce our labour costs um, and look at the other things that we can do to, to to save money without impacting on on the product and and the the service. Um, so yeah, I guess the bottom line is the the big thing we're doing is looking at how we can reduce that price for the uh, for the consumers and, and to help us get into the supermarkets to make it more um, viable as well. So hopefully everyone will see a price decrease rather than an increase to help help uh, everyone still buy quality food that's plant based. Lovely. Laura, let's go to you because uh, I know you were talking about how it's great your, your sales have increased and obviously it's particularly in the gifting arena. So in terms of, you know, a potentially anticipated deep recession, again, luxury items, you know, might kind of take a hit. So any, anything you're doing or thinking about in terms of those kind of long-term strategies? Yeah, we're looking at items, especially, like I said, around the gifting um, with lower price points than our current offering. And we're just being really strategic with what we spend and how we spend on now and um, we keep our teams quite flexible and um, so kind of just managing the resource that we've got kind of either dialing up or dialing it down as and when we need it to so we can keep our overheads um, as low as possible during these times as well but it's just really a lot of research making sure we're investing into areas we only really need to invest into and making sure as well um, that we are that we're well stocked and we, we don't have to because we have to place an order for quite a large amount of, of watches at a time and um, just making sure that we're well stocked now so when that does actually hit we're not having to outlay big costs whilst we're during that um, so we can make that return back now to cover us as well um, but really it's just kind of managing and just keeping our costs as low as possible and then trying to introduce something and um, which we're trying to get in for the Christmas market now lower price point items to suit you know the current climate that we're in 
Nice. Anyone else want to chime in on that particular question? Yes, I wouldn't mind chiming in. Yes, Sue, go ahead. <laughs> I, <Time> think, <laughs> I think consumers are a lot more savvy these days and they're looking for value for money, but not just cheap. They basically want the product to be effective. Mm. So, for example, the JR Liggett's shampoo bar. I mean, this, this is a price point of $9.99 a bar but it's the same length of time as you would on average use three bottles of liquid shampoo. So they're looking for value and quality combined. And I think this is, you know, this is a big change. They're also a lot more aware um, of the effect of, of manufacturing on the planet and on the environment. So zero waste, no plastic, yeah. you know, it's literally, they're, they're considering all different options. So I don't think it is just about price itself. That's interesting. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. We've got, I think we've got a couple of, we've got another, yeah, we've got a couple of other questions. Uh, Helen, oops, where's she gone? Helen. Uh, hi, Helen. She said, Every, hi, everyone. It's awesome to hear that so many of you have been using the time during COVID to rethink, analyze and diversify while pushing ahead with MPD. Do you see this has been a good opportunity uh, um, for independent brands like ours to gain some traction against the bigger brands that were unable to stay open, keep shipping orders or offer operate their supply chains from home it's an interesting one who'd like to shall i uh, shall i say yeah, that? Adrian, I, it's, and it's just a really a personal and then we'll go to really yeah. here and uh, and sometimes i have to go with those personal comments which are which are instinct and and i think there's a there are disruptive brands that come into the market and and, and do very well on the smaller side um but on the other end of the scale i i do feel that um the current pandemic what is has allowed to happen is that the uh, the larger multinationals uh, are, are gaining traction with their own brands um, because of supply chain issues. Um, that's particularly the major retailers may, may see that they are safer um, in supply chain issues, keeping shelves fuller. And so I do think that, that the multiples will um, come out of this a little bit better than the disruptor brands. Um, the investment that uh, and, and, and the cash that these multinationals have, they can ride out these kind of uh, storms much, much better than the smaller brands. So whilst there are a great deal of opportunities to be had and, and, and you know, lots of people are developing and taking advantage of that, I do feel that over the long term, we will look back at this and say, this was the point where the, uh, the, the, the balance swung very gently and maybe imperceivably and, and maybe in the future may be wrong but I think we will look back here and say that this was the point where um, the multinationals really um, took hold of the major part of the market uh, and I, I, I hate to say it but I, I think that's where we will see it and I'm hoping that you know through the development of, of web-based sales and more direct sales and the strength of the independent market will 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 continue to exist, but I I, I do feel that the the teeth are slightly in further um, for the multinationals. Rimi and um, thank you, Adrian. Rimi and uh, Manav, do you agree with? I know you wanted to say something. Do you agree with Adrian or not? No, no. I think I think he's right. I think with the with the supermarkets etc., the big brands did very very well because everybody knows them. They've got big. They're available everywhere. Convenience supermarket so it was easy for people to buy but i think if you're if you're a new product now or because we've got friends you know the booch and brew they make kombucha you know and they want to we've we've you know they're asking us for some advice and we've said look go for the distributors because the distributors like suma you know all of the like clf tree of life those types of health food distributors in the uk they need mpd that's you know they have their new catalogs every quarter or every few months that they need to fill with so the buyers are still open to MPD. So I would definitely, I probably won't go for the supermarkets yet. I'd just go for those independent distributors and just keep targeting and keep pushing because they're very, they're always open to MPD. You know, even like, and with the big, like Waitrose and et cetera, we see now, mm. like it wasn't March, April, May, June, but from July onwards, they now want to see MPD. You know, so the listings that we've got in September have only come about in the last 30 days. It was, everything was being very, very quick, yeah. you know. And also, I mean, I don't know what um, category uh, they're in, but direct to consumer, um, you know, that that would be, you know, a good channel to focus on too. 
Yeah, brilliant. No, really good advice. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for, because we're getting in the wrap up, so we've probably got time for about one more question, which we've got, and that's from, uh, I don't know if it's pronounced Jacob or Jakob. Um, I hope I've pronounced it right. Hey, Katrina, thanks for hosting. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, it's great to see so many vegan businesses thrive in such a difficult period of time. It sounds like the majority of the panelists have gone through investment of some sort. Uh, what were the biggest challenges they've faced and what advice could they offer to a business seeking investment oh and that's from oh from uh jacob is from citizen kind emma sends her best oh lovely citizen kind is a lovely vegan recruitment company thanks so for those of you now who has had investment min uh, min mini sorry i've got i've just <laughs> joined your names up there uh manav and rimi um yeah you've definitely had experience with investment because like i mentioned earlier you turned down dragon's den um you know to uh, deborah meaden and and tuka um you turned them down and waited so i think it would be great if you could um answer that one again we were very lucky we, we finished our raise with blue horizon in november so we were financially that way secure but if i was in somebody else's position now looking at what's happening in the market valuations have come down because investors have a lot more you know a lot more power at the moment in terms of the market but i would focus on raising a low figure i don't know how much they need but 100 to 200 thousand people have still got appetite for you know from speaking to other companies that have recently raised on Cedars and Crowdcube, 100, 200 seems to be an okay figure. So I would look for maybe angel investors and people with still with money, you know, to raise a lower amount and then maybe get yourself, see where the bit economy is in six months time, get your business up and running for what you need and then go and raise bigger or go to the VCs. But if I was in their position now, it would be a low figure just to keep me going, you know, just for cash flow to survive whatever their goal is or if it's for growth but definitely a low figure and it's easier to raise a lower amount and then you might get a lot more people who want to overfund you and you might be able to get some more money and I, I think it's definitely positive you know to seek investment you know for us I don't think we would have been able to grow and scale um, to the extent that, that we have so and, and it's also about finding the right partner um, you know, whereas Dragon's Den, it just didn't mm. feel right to move forward with that. Whereas, you know, Blue Horizon, you know, we're very aligned, you know, as Tammy was saying, um, you know, their, 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 their portfolio is very sustainable, vegan, and, you know, we, 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 we're all on the same page. We understand each other. But then there's also channels such as, you know, crowdfunding, you know, which are quite successful yeah. for um, you know, smaller companies as well. And, and you can get a good higher valuation yes. on, on these but, um, yes. platforms. Well, you'll always need those investors offline first. Yes. And then, then get an online. An anchor investor. And then, investor. And then yeah. you, but, you, you have that loyal following but, of yeah. your consumers. But it, it could, from our experience, it took nine months from speaking to Blue Horizon to getting the money. And that was because of summer and et cetera and the due diligence. So allow that time. Allow that time to start now. And it's a full time job raising money, probably yeah. like everyone. Tell That's you. really good advice, actually. I'll just go briefly to Laura because I know you've also recently had investments. Is there anything you'd uh, quickly like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I think it's. Um... It's, it can be quite a daunting task and finding the right investors is, is key. Um, I was always quite skeptical. I think I was a bit naive in the beginning when I launched Botch and thought I could grow it organically. Um, but we have had to change. Um, as I said, we were quite quite fortunate in the fact that we'd had almost four years trading at the time that we went to seek investment. So we had proven traction and we could demonstrate a growing market. So it's really important that you demonstrate to um, any key investors your market, how it's growing and also how it's going to shape out and how you predict it's going to shape out in the current climate. We've had to obviously rejig our figures slightly uh, and put more realistic expectations in than we may have done back in February, March. Um, but yeah, it's really key to just find somebody, find an investor with kind of relevant expertise. Um, we were really fortunate. Our first investor meeting, we, we got investment and um, we've actually brought two investors on. The first two investor meetings said yes. Um, so for us, the whole turnaround time was actually pretty quick. We, we saw the money within a couple of weeks. Um, so it, it can go one of two ways. I was, I was expecting and preparing for the worst and preparing for a long slog. Um, but it's just networking, getting out there and just pulling in those resources around you that you know can measure and build and, you know, scale and make your business succeed. 
Absolutely. And just on that, I'll just wrap up on that. On my website, veganbusinessmedia.com, there's a blog post called How to Get a, an Investor for Your Vegan Business. And it's actually a list of vegan and vegan friendly investors, including the types of things they invest in and how to pitch them. And I've also interviewed quite a few investors on the Vegan Business Talk podcast. So you can check that out because it's really worth listening because they each have different ways that they like to be pitched. And it's always good to go in with as much information as you can rather than just kind of, hey, give me money kind of thing. So so that's a great question, um, I think, and when we're going to have to um, wrap up on, on that. Um, but look, thank you so much to everyone. You shared so much really brilliant insights and expertise. You've been really generous with your, your time and the, the information that you shared.